Hi, I'm Swede White. My talk is called Computational Public Relations, What Happens When We Apply Computation Everywhere. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about some methods in social network analysis and service connect in the Wolfram language uh, to see how we can use computation to better public relations outreach and messaging. Thank you for joining me for my talk uh, this afternoon. Thank you for coming to the Wolfram Technology Conference. Uh, my name is Swede White. I work in the Public Relations Department uh, at Wolfram Research. I'm a, a media and communication specialist, uh, meaning largely I deal with uh, external press relations and things of that nature. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about computational public relations. Uh, the subtitle is What Happens When We Apply Computation Everywhere. And it has two meanings here. One, uh, public relations is not typically thought of a technical field where we're going to be using a ton of computation, uh, a ton of programming and things like that. Uh, the other meaning is part of our job in public relations is to spread the message. What happens when we apply computation everywhere, especially through Wolfram products? Uh, a little bit about me before we begin. Uh, prior to joining Wolfram, uh, I was a doctoral student in sociology at Louisiana State University uh, studying social networks and identity formation uh, through social networks, through that theoretical lens. I also worked in public media uh, at an NPR affiliate in Baton Rouge for a little while. Uh, so I've been on the kind of journalism side of public relations, and now I'm on the other side of the glass dealing with journalists. So the field of public relations is kind of lagged behind marketing. Uh, the two are kind of intertwined. Uh, marketing is a little bit more, um, they have in the past employed more methods like A-B testing, um, really brought in some of the scientific method uh, into what they do to get their message out into the world. Public relations, uh, some might describe it a little bit more fluffy uh, than marketing, uh, but these two things are st uh, starting to merge. Uh, with the emergence of things like influencer marketing, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult uh, to tell the difference between a, pers uh, a piece of content that you're reading on the web or in a newspaper uh, and a piece of marketing material. Uh, so when public relations comes in and we're dealing with media and putting out content to media, uh, we're starting to use some of these marketing methods in public relations. Also, the democratization of access to data and computational methods is making it easier for someone who's less technical like me uh, to use some of these methods uh, from data science uh, to kind of get our message out there, uh, measure success a little bit better, uh, and figure out who to target, when, how, and why. So first, I'm going to talk about what is public relations, even though I've kind of described it a little bit. Uh, example one, uh, I'm going to use Service Connect uh, with Wolfram Language. Are any of you familiar with Service Connect in Wolfram Language? Just two of you. Awesome. OK. All right. Uh, then we're going to look at Twitter. And then also uh, a trade show, uh, a social network of trade show influencers. Um, and we're going to have a brief model of information diffusion. So the Wolfram language defines word, uh, public relations as a promotion intended to create goodwill for a person or institution. I like the goodwill part of that um, because in public relations we do try to uh, have a sense of ethics about us, um, not be manipulative, um, not put something out there uh, that's going to be deceptive. Uh, we always try to be honest. Um, so Edward Bernays uh, is kind of a a pioneer in the field of public relations, and he had three prongs to public relations. And one, it's information provided to the public, just in a pure form. Uh, two, it's persuasion directed at the public to modify attitudes and actions. So as you can imagine, ethics comes into uh, play here when we're trying to modify people's behavior to do something. And then finally, efforts to integrate attitudes and actions of an institution with its publics and of publics with that institution. So as I mentioned earlier, traditional media and advertising are becoming less important with the advent of social and new media, and especially with influencer marketing. And research shows us that face-to-face -face and word-of-mouth influence are still crucial to spreading that information, kind of uh, contradictory to this importance of social media. So it's still important for us to get out there into the world and deal with people face-to-face. -face. Uh, in example three, uh, I'm going to show you how that's important and how we can possibly measure that. So as I mentioned, Edward Bernays, he wrote a book called Propaganda. That was one of the first general expositions uh, on the art of persuading large groups of people. Uh, propaganda has kind of a bad rap these days, uh, and that's not uh, necessarily uh, for bad reason. Um, but propaganda, the word itself, actually comes from Pope Gregory the 15th in 1622 uh, when he created the Congregation for Propagating the Faith. So really, the, the core of the word is any practice to propagate an ideology or practice. And for us, that's the Wolfram language and using the Wolfram language. So how long has public relations existed? When we look at marketing, propaganda, and advertising, we see a spike beginning in the early 20th century. Uh, and Edward Bernays was writing uh, around that time. 
And uh, what's interesting is we see propaganda decreasing with marketing and advertising increasing. Um, do what you will with that. So first example, Service Connect Reddit. So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Service Connect, uh, basically we have a built-in function that uses various APIs in a very easy to understand way. So if you're using another program language and accessing Reddit's API, you're gonna have to do a fairly extensive amount of programming. Uh, with Wolfram Language, we can do something as simple as Service Connect Reddit. And there we have it. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is uh, grab some comments from an ask, uh, uh, ask Me Anything from Reddit. Uh, is everyone here familiar with Ask Me Anything on Reddit? Yes, anyone not familiar? Okay, so basically on Reddit, which is kind of a, a social, not quite a social network, but a, kind of a social interaction forum, um, people of note uh, can go on this platform and say, I am Stephen Wolfram, ask me anything. And people can ask questions, and so Stephen, response to these questions. I believe he's done three of these. Uh, this one in particular we're going to be examining uh, is about his latest book, uh, Idea Makers, okay? So what we do is we grab comments and we're going to use the similarities function using nearest. And what we're gonna do is take each of the questions people have asked and clump these together in a network so we can more easily discern what people are interested in knowing from Stephen Wolfram. So once we have our network, uh, these are sized, each node uh, is sized by their popularity. So the more upvotes a comment got, the larger the node size. We've also used community graph plot here to kind of more uh, easily visualize these various clumps. So the most popular uh, is someone saying there's a, a huge fan, uh, spent a lot of time, a uh, huge gamut of personalities, then has a kind of interesting question about Richard Feynman uh, at the bottom. Um, Another person asking about uh, the commonality between legendary mathematician scientists from ages ago and more modern scientists. Uh, and then we go over here, we have a question about, is writing about all these intelligent people, or did you notice any environmental factors which may have contributed to their success? Uh, why is Elon Musk not included in the book? <laughs> What's 30 meters per second and kilometers per second? Uh, I think that's a, a query better directed at Wolfram Alpha. Uh, and hi, Stephen, any inspirational words? Uh, so we have a wide variety of topics here, um, and I chose this one because it's smaller, and for the uh, purposes of this presentation, it's kind of easier to show you what's going on. But in some of Stephen's other AMAs, there are many more questions, many more comments. Uh, and if you look at other subreddits, uh, you can grab interesting information. And I should note, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm using things that are Wolfram-centric. Um, I don't wanna sit here and do an analysis of a competitor <laughs> and be like, oh, this is what we're doing in public relations, so anyway. All right, so what we can do from there uh, is use a built-in uh, classifier, which is sentiment. So we have a fairly decent um, uh, built-in machine learning classifier for sentiment in Wolfram language. Uh, and so most of them are neutral. <laughs> we have a little bit more negative than positive, um, which, you know, okay. Um, we also have an interesting classifier uh, that's by topic. Uh, and so uh, a couple years ago, uh, we had this thing called a Facebook uh, data donor program. And so a lot of people donated a bunch of data from their Facebook feeds. Uh, and so what we did is take a lot of status updates and we labeled them and we categorized them. And we came up with a bunch of different categories uh, that we have then turned into a classifier. You can see here, a classify Facebook topic. Um, this is a, a huge time saver. Um, and so unsurprisingly, most of these comments are about books. Uh, since it's about idea makers, we aren't too terribly surprised there. So next we're gonna look at Twitter. Uh, and this works uh, in a similar method. Uh, just simply service connect Twitter. Uh, the parameters are fairly simple. Uh, and for, we're gonna look at Wolfram Research first, the Wolfram Research Twitter feed. So we can get some basic information. Um, location, our follower count, friends count, favorite count. Uh, then we can look at our tweet strings, and we're gonna create a word cloud um, of the, let's see, we have the last 4,000 tweets from Wolfram Research. And so, as you can see, Wolfram is right there. Uh, Wolfram Tech Conference, this is interesting because it's the uh, most, most recent thing we've been tweeting about. Then we have our social media manager's initials right here, because uh, she signs uh, some of our tweets when uh, we're doing customer service uh, type responses uh, to people that are mentioning us on Twitter. So we can also examine recent hashtags. Uh, and while we're looking at Wolfram Research, you can imagine if you were looking at other people that are on Twitter, this might become interesting from a public relations perspective. So most recently, we've had Wolf Lang, which is unsurprising. 
uh, Wolfram Tech Conference, Wolfram Language Tips, um, Exploding Dots, I'm not sure uh, what that is, and Software Design. Uh, software Design is largely from, yes? It came from a MoMath talk. A MoMath talk. Excellent. Good. <laughs> All right, so we can do the same thing again, uh, looking at uh, sentiment analysis for our tweets. Um, and it's good to know that what we're sending out into the world is mostly positive, or at least the, the machine learning algorithm thinks it's mostly positive. Uh, we're not putting negativity out into the world, uh, although there's a little bit of indeterminate here. Um, we could go in further and uh, figure out what that is. So we can also do something similar that we did uh, with Reddit as far as a graph, but what we're doing here is looking at a follower mention network. So these are our followers that mention each other on Twitter. So right here we have Wolfram Research, and we can see who's mentioning Wolfram uh, out of the people that we follow. Unsurprisingly, it's Wolfram Events. Uh, Christian Pascal, he is actually the person uh, who works on our Service Connect features. So the things I'm showing you today, this is him uh, and his teams, a lot of their hard work. Um, and then Christian Rodriguez, uh, he used to be a student ambassador of ours. Um, now he is with the Computational Thinking Initiative, a Wolfram success story. Uh, and this is Vitaly. I'm sure some of you who know Wolfram um, have heard of him. Um, and Clayton Schonkweiler. Um, if you've ever been on Wolfram Community and you've seen any of the amazing GIFs, uh, mathematical GIFs that are on there, uh, it's probably Clayton um, that has made some of them. Uh, so these are the people mentioning Wolfram. And then over here, um, we have uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who this person, Marie Dimitrova, has mentioned. Um, so he's kind of loosely connected, which is interesting because he does interact with Wolfram products a lot. So then we have uh, Periscope, National Geographic, Twitter video, and Periscope TV. And then we have all these sad, lonely people here, and then just Miriam Webster and Twitter and Tumblr, uh, who are not mentioning us or one another. All right, so another thing we can do is look at when Wolfram Research or any other Twitter user tweets most. So what we see for Wolfram Research is around 9.30, 10 o'clock, uh, we're tweeting a lot and it falls off uh, throughout the day. Occasionally we tweet at 3 o'clock in the morning, apparently. And then also the day of the week. So Wednesdays are our most popular for us. Um, Mondays, I guess we have the blues on Monday and then on weekends we're not tweeting too much. So we can also look at all-time counts. I found this really interesting, uh, going back to um, July 14th, um, how often we've been tweeting. And as you can see, there's a huge outlier here. Um, and I guess back at uh, the tech conference, back in the 14th, uh, we were live tweeting the tech conference to something to the tune of like 70 tweets in a day or something like that, which is a lot. Um, one other thing we can do is explore uh, certain hashtags on Twitter. So we don't have to use just hashtags. We can use any kind of phrase. Uh, we can look at users. We can use any kind of mentions on Twitter. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to pull up machine learning um, as an example. Uh, so as you can see here, the, 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 the code is very simple. So we've defined Twitter earlier with Service Connect, and we're just doing tweet search, query, machine learning, and then I'm just going to pull 100 items. Um, I think we can pull up to 5,000. I would have to check Twitter's API. There is a max limit to how many you can pull at once. So what we've done is created a network again uh, with tooltip. And so we can look, and these are sized, by the way. The bigger the node, this is the more retweets these have gotten. So it's kind of a proxy to measure how popular they are. We can also look at favorite counts as well. So we see this fellow over here has, uh, someone's RTing this fellow, how our artificial intelligence can deliver a personalized banking experience. And then see, we see the financial services tweet, which is very similar with FinTech. And then solutions can support city deal plans. And we see these self loops because these are very, these loops right here, because these are very similar tweets. So this person, DeepLearn007, seems to be some sort of influencer with machine learning on Twitter. Uh, which would be interesting to explore more. There he is again. And then we have these kind of sad, lonely people, these sad little tweets over here, just kind of hanging out. So what we can do again is use our classifier to see what categories these fall into uh, in machine learning under that hashtag. Unsurprisingly, technology. What was surprising to me, though, was video games. Um, so it would be interesting to go into the, the, class of the Facebook classifier and see why it's categorizing these mach machine learning tweets into video games. What is it about them that it thinks are related to video games? 
So we can also look at uh, CEO analysis on Twitter. So we're going to look at Stephen Wolfram and what people are saying about Stephen Wolfram on Twitter. Again, we have a very simple query, and I've actually um, I've queried his actual Twitter handle because uh, I want to see what people are, how they're mentioning him here. And so first, what I've done is use some code here uh, to take um, the top words, most significant words, um, out of strings on Twitter that people are saying about him. And so we have physicists make great entrepreneurship and then entrepreneurs. Um, when I first saw that, I giggled um, because someone published an article talking about how physicists make really great entrepreneurs. Um, and it seems to be going strong for about three or four weeks now. Um, and it just keeps popping up uh, in our, our analytics. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, obviously, we could go in. Uh, if we wanted to get rid of that, we could put that in our delete sto uh, our stop words, right? Uh, so then we could get rid of those and see what else is going on. But we also have startup. Uh, story that's actually related to that tweet. Um, video, um, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are aware, if you heard in Steven's keynote, uh, he is doing a lot of Twitch broadcasts. If you're not familiar with Twitch, it is a live streaming platform. Uh, so Steven, if he's sitting down late in the evening to do some coding, some research, uh, he will hit start streaming and you can tune in with him. Uh, he's also been streaming uh, some meetings, um, design review meetings, which is interesting. We weren't sure how that would go over, live streaming meetings. <laughs> well, from research, but we've gotten a lot of good feedback from it. So we can go in and look at uh, some of the tweets. Uh, so we have some feedback. Uh, where is it at? Over here. No, that's not it. So this is when he was in Scotland just this past weekend. Uh, he was giving uh, the keynote at the Darcy Thompson on Growth and Form uh, at 100 conference. Um, there was some feedback on Twitch. Here we go. Uh, so feedback on Twitch here, people tweeting about it. Software design live, um, live streaming internal design review, um, then something about arrival, and then people watching him on Twitch. So again, we can classify these pretty easily. Um, and very happy to see that there are more positives than negatives about Steven on Twitter. Always good. And then it's categorizing these as mostly about television. Um, my suspicion is that uh, because of uh, Twitch, um, because he's mentioning video so much, that it's categorizing these things into television, then also video games, because uh, Twitch is uh, largely used for streaming video games. So the last example I wanted to show you uh, is probably the most interesting. Um, it's conference attendees, social networks, and information diffusion. Uh, so let's say uh, I have lists of potential Wolfram language evangelists or influencers that attend different conferences, and I have these separate lists. What I want to do is combine those lists and then come up with some sort of association matrix so I can figure out who in this list is the most important. Who should I target? Who should I give information to uh, so that they'll share that information, right? And so one way that we go about uh, not making sure but encouraging people to share information is to tell them a secret. Because uh, if you've ever told someone a secret before, uh, you've probably noticed that they tell other people that secret. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't want to go so far as to call it a leak of information, um, but one of the, I guess, more dark arts of public relations would be maybe telling people some secrets. Uh, so first, we have all these lists, and we have to wrangle the data. Uh, this is probably the most uh, boring part of, of uh, doing this type of work, um, but it has to be done. Fortunately, Wolfram Language makes it pretty easy. Uh, so as you can see in our data structure, I have some various conferences. Then I have a name, and then zeros and ones indicating if they attend, attended that conference or plan to attend that conference. So what I want to do is change that into Boolean true-false values. Uh, to make it cleaner and easier and create, uh, give column one a header, which is important. We need to have a name header there uh, and create an association. And so what this does is this gives us a really nice data set uh, so that we can then query. Um, so what we're going to do first is create uh, a network at the conference level. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with social networks. That's kind of big. Let me get that down a little bit. So each node represents a conference. Each red node represents a conference. And each line in there represents a connection to that conference from these attendees. So as you can see, I have Strata here, SIGGRAPH, CES, South by Southwest, Collision, JSM, JMM, Tech Week, and Disrupt. 
So what we can then do is manipulate this graph a little bit. So I want to know which one of these conferences have the most influencers going to it. So what we can do is create another graph, and I'm going to use color data here so that the brightest colored node of the conferences is the one that has the most vertices, so the most lines, which translates into uh, conference attendees. So it's a really quick, easy way to visualize this. And so you can see South by Southwest and Collision uh, are the most popular among our, at our, our attendees, our influencers. So what we can do next is go down to the person level. So we're going to create an adjacency matrix. And so we have all of our uh, conference attendees here. We can see these clusters right here. Uh, so we can see these people are more connected uh, among all of these conferences. Uh, so these might be people that I'm more interested in uh, giving s information to uh, than others, some of these more outlier folks um, that really aren't very connected. So we have in network science and social network analysis, we have various measures of what we call centrality. And basically what that means is how embedded someone is in the network um, based on shortest paths between vertices that pass through that vertex. Okay? So what we can do again is use color data to look at who has the, the highest between this centrality, right? Uh, and so this really uh, starts to narrow things down, especially when you see this person right here. We also have, uh-oh, pinwheel of death. So what we can do is then make a quick function uh, to tell us who are these top five people. Uh, and by the way, these are fake names. <laughs> Um, obviously, that was supposed to be, I was going to name that person Griffith, but apparently I named him Zachary Griffithy. Uh, <laughs> so we can see quickly who has the highest between the centrality, and we can see like a, a pretty big difference between this person and the rest. Uh, so this is someone that would, I would definitely flag uh, as interesting here. Um, we also have uh, closeness centrality, which is slightly different, but as you can see, it's not quite as good of a measure, because look at how close, well, not to pun, but how close all these uh, colors are together. Um, but one other measure we have is um, eigenvector centrality, uh, which is a little bit better here. Uh, so what we can see is we have our same person here. If that, let's see. OK, oh, there we go. We have the same person here, John Whitney. And we confirm that right here. And again, we can see this person has a, a pretty substantially higher uh, eigenvector centrality than the others. So what we can do then is take John Whitney and put him in a neighborhood graph to see exactly how he's connecting to all these conferences. And not surprisingly, he plans to attend all of them. So this person might be someone I would be more interested in giving information to uh, rather than one of these outliers. So what I'm going to do finally is look at a little bit of information diffusion and how to model that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is use an epidemiological model and uh, have a coin toss uh, probability that someone that interacts with a neighbor is going to spread that information. We can change that probability depending on how juicy our information is or something like that. Uh, one of the difficulties with uh, measuring things like this is it's really difficult. Like, let's say I tell someone a secret. Um, how am I going to effectively and scientifically measure uh, how that secret spread? Um, there are some ways that I can think of, but it's not exactly going to be robust, right? Uh, so the best thing that we can do is model it uh, and try to figure out what might happen. Uh, so what I'm going to do is start off with um, a random graph. Uh, and this is a small world network. Um, if you have not heard of small world graphs, uh, you've probably heard of six degrees of separation. Yes? OK, yeah, so this is this type of network that it is. Um, and interestingly, they're also found in uh, C. elegans worm brains, which I thought was an interesting tidbit about small world networks. Uh, so as you can see, we start off with our red node, and this is someone I've given information to. And after one step, here's how many people have potentially received that information. After several steps, we have this network with all the inf infected yellow nodes that we're going to call it. So then we can model this with a manipulate and see how this might play out over certain iterations. So as you can see, it happens fairly quickly in a small world network. Um, and it's worth pointing out that all, not all networks are small world networks. Our real life networks, our social networks, a lot of them happen to be. However, not all of them are. Um, so the network that I just showed with all of my conference attendees, we can test to see if it's a small world network. And we can also plug that into here uh, to measure, for example, if I gave John Whitney uh, a piece of information, we can then model how likely it is that that information is going to spread 
through that network. Um, again, very difficult to measure. Um, so with that, questions, comments, suggestions? You can also use the person connect function to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and contact me by email. Yes. Yes, I'll build it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so what happens is um, when, you, when you use, uh, well, I'll just explain it and show. Uh, so what happens when you, when you run that piece of code, uh, it'll open a web browser. Uh, and so what's very cool uh, is that instead of having to have uh, your key uh, for your Twitter account, you will need a Reddit account or a Twitter account, right? Uh, so what's interesting, instead of having to have that API key, we have something called Wolfram Connector. And what it does is it opens a web browser and it just asks for, your, asks for authorization. Uh, to access the Twitter API or the Reddit API through your account. You just press OK, and you go back to Wolfram language, and you're good to go um, with all the different API calls. Um, so the Reddit and Twitter uh, API calls in Wolfram language are in the documentation. It's pretty extensive. No, no, no. It's all of it's, uh, so there's rate limits. Um, aside from that, they're, they're of no cost. They're built into the Wolfram language. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, there are about 10 uh, centrality measures in Wolfram language, if I recall correctly. Um, the best one to use would be between a centrality for the purposes of social network analysis. Eigenvector centrality has a little bit slightly more robust algorithm. Um, however, it's less commonly used in social network analysis, in my experience. Um, that all of that is in the documentation and outlined there like quite extensively, though. Right. Okay.